Coastal Systems and Landscapes introduction lesson. This is the first lesson in the Coastal Systems and Landscapes unit for AS uh, slash A-level geography. Um, it's going to be a bit of an overview today of different things such as inputs and outputs to the coast um, and basically the coast as a system. Okay, so firstly, what is a system? This is a bit of a recap from the uh, water and carbon cycles unit. So a system is something which has a series of inputs, outputs, transfers, attributes. Um, it might have a boundary and everything within that interacts to form different features and in the coasts, it interacts to form the different um, landscapes and landforms that we see and that you will know and love. Um, so different parts of a system, I've just mentioned them there. You've got the inputs, that's things that go into the system. Uh, in the case of coasts, we talk about energy going into the system. So inputs, where does the coast get its energy from? Uh, the outputs are the things that are results from that energy. Um, so we'll come on to those a bit later in the lesson. How does this apply to the coast? Well, I've just talked about a couple of ways in which um, the coast is affected and has inputs and outputs. So, yeah, well, just if you are unfamiliar with any of the systems terms, just go back to your, co to your water and carbon cycles key terms. We did a big sheet of all the key terms about systems. So if I say anything throughout this, and you think, I don't really remember what that was, um, have a look on that sheet, or if uh, failing that, just get in touch with me, drop me an email, okay? Okay, so the inputs to the coastal system. Um, it, when we talk about inputs in coasts, we talk about the sediment as an input, and we talk about the energy as an input and there's two different categories you get the inputs from the land and the inputs from the sea the input from the land is only really um, material that is put into the system through things like your cliff collapse mass movement and other things like that so you can see in the top left picture you've got a lovely section of cliff probably along the south coast, Jurassic coastline of the UK, collapsing into the sea, and all that sediment is now input to the coastal system where the coast can use it, it can move it around, it can deposit it, it can transport it, and it will end up forming other features. So that sediment has been input to the system and it's now available to the system. The rest of the cliff, you can see the side of it, is still intact, so not much sediment is going to be picked up from that section of the cliff um, so that is when we talk about sediment as an input it's available sediment to the system that it can pick up and move around and use the other sources are from the sea so you can see here the picture with the arrows on it is your lovely longshore drift diagram um, if you're unfamiliar with that again just recap that from um, from GCSE. We'll all be going over it a bit later on in the unit, so don't worry about that too much. Um, then in the top right, you can see you've got a picture of the tides. So obviously the tides are caused by the moon and the interaction between the moon and the water um, and its gravitational pull. And obviously at high tide, the sea has very different characteristics to at low tide. Um, and that is going to provide energy and sediment to the system. In the bottom right, you can see the ocean currents diagram. Um, and ocean currents move all the way around the world. Warm water is heated up at the equator. It goes north where it cools down, heads back down as cold water, it goes around in a cycle until it's reheated again. Um, those of you who watch Finding Nemo, you've got like the East Australia current, that sort of thing. Again, that transports energy and it transports sediment all around the system. Bottom middle, you can see a nice big powerful wave there. Um, obviously, waves provide the coast with a lot of energy and they can provide it with sediment as well. 
Um, and then bottom left, you've got the wind. Now, the wind causes the waves. So you can't have waves without the wind. OK, so those are your six main sediments, one from the land, which is your sediment. Uh, sorry, your main input, one from the land, which is your sediment. And the rest um, are from the ocean. OK, most wind comes from the ocean because wind is caused by the difference in air pressure. So what usually happens is over the land, the air gets heated up a lot uh, quicker. So that's why lands on lands often warmer than out at sea. That air, that air over the land, which is hotter, rises up and cold air from the sea moves in to replace it. So the cold air from the sea moves on land to replace the air that's risen up. Um, and yeah, that's why you get more wind at the coast. stores in the coastal system so a store is any part of the coast where sediment remains for a period of time and the sediment can either be removed from this or added to it so i've got some diagrams here you can see on the left you have a picture of a lovely beach um, beaches are caused by deposition so the material is stored on the beach and it can be removed from the beach or added to the beach, in fact. Um, in the middle, you've got a lovely picture of a sand dune. And again, sand dunes are very fragile. The material can be added really easily, but it can also be removed if there's a big storm. And on the right hand side, you probably recognize that. That's Dawlish Warren, and that's an example of a spit. Again, spits are large areas of sand that's been deposited and material can either be removed or added from this. So beach, a sand dune and a spit bar or tombolo are the main forms of stores in the coastal system. If, you, if you're wondering what the hell is a bar or a tombolo, um, a bar is where a spit joins onto another piece of land. A tombolo is where a spit joins onto an island. Flows in the coastal system. So a flow in the coastal system is where energy or sediment moves from one store to another store. Same as in any system, whatever system you're talking about, a flow is the movement between stores. Uh, these can be seaward, which means material or energy moves from land towards the sea, or landward, where material moves from the sea towards the land. The main forms of flows are transportation, so that includes your uh, methods from GCSE of sediment transportation, and they are solution, suspension, saltation, traction, and longshore drift. So those are your transportation methods. Erosion, um, again, that's all the methods you learn at GCSE. We'll come on to erosion and transportation and deposition in a few lessons time. So if you if you're thinking I'm a bit unsure what those terms mean, don't worry too much. Um, erosion is the removal of sediment and where it's taken away from uh, wherever it's been stored. And deposition is the opposite where material is added to a store. So those are the three flows in a coastal system, transportation, erosion and deposition. Outputs from the coastal system. So this is where sediment and energy leave the system um, for good and they don't come back essentially. So your outputs are, they can move inland. So for example, on the left, you've got a picture of a sand dune where the sand has been transported from the beach where it's available to the sea to an area where it's not available from the sea. Um, and you can see that area started to be covered by grass because the sea doesn't reach it anymore, so it can't take away sediment from it. Another way it might be lost to the system is through longshore drift, be carried along the beach and out of the system. And the last one is the sea can just blast the rock away, take it out to sea, and then it will enter a different part of the coast. Um, so it will leave one system and go into another. Um, so this is all losses from the system in terms of outputs. And 
outputs, so losses of energy and sediment from the system, will result in various landforms. And you're probably looking at these thinking, oh, this brings back some fond memories of GCSE geography. Or you might be looking at those thinking, what the hell are they? So I'll take you through them one by one. In the top left, we have a, you're probably saying this in your head, you know exactly what this is. It is a wave cut platform. So a wave cut platform is basically an, a scar of where the cliff used to be. It's kind of like a tree stump. When you cut down a tree, you're left with a tree stump. When a cliff collapses, you're left with a wave cut platform. So that's formed when cliffs collapse and the material is carried away. Um, in the top middle, you've got a wave cut notch. So that cliff has been undercut and eventually the wave cut notch will collapse. Um, and it will form a wave cut platform uh, as in the top left. In the top right we've got headlands and bays again formed by erosion. So a headland is the bit of harder rock that sticks out into the sea and the bay is the bit of softer rock that retreats inland and you're left with these landforms like this. Now I say harder and softer because it can be two types of hard rock, one slightly weaker than the other, or two types of soft rock, one slightly softer than the other. So it's important that you don't just say, oh, the headland's hard rock, the bay's soft rock, because it, they can both be examples of hard rock, but one just slightly weaker than the other. In the bottom left, you've got cliffs. Um, bottom middle, you've got some stacks and stumps there. And in the bottom right, you've got Dirdle door, which is an example of an arch. So cave, arch, stack, stump, that's your bread and butter GCSE um, landforms. Again, we'll be going over all these um, later on in the unit, so don't worry too much if you're thinking, what the heck are these? Another output that's not often considered is the landward movement of material, and you often get huge sand dune systems um, that can be hundreds of metres tall, forming along coastal areas um, where the sand is basically carried by the sea up the beach and then the wind can move it out of reach of the sea. So those dunes that you can see in both of those images probably haven't been touched by the sea in a very long time and only will be accessed by the sea during a big storm. So also consider sand dune systems um, as an output to the coastal system where sediment leaves, um, sediment essentially leaves the coastal system and moves to, to the land system. This is a geological map of Torquay. Um, so you can see some of the key features on here. The different colours are the different rock types that we've got. Um, so you can see the red colour is your Permian red beds. Now these are made up of sedimentary sandstone um, and the key areas for these are your areas where you've got red sands beaches. So for example, Tor Abbey sands is red sands beach, Livermead sands, red sand again. Um, and those of you that are familiar with Odicum, Odicum beach again is a red sands beach. Now that sand is a lot weaker than the areas around it and you can see that on the geological map where the areas labelled Torquay Seafront, Corbin's Head, Livermead Sands and Livermead Head are a lot further back than for example the areas at Thatcher Point, Meadfoot Beach, Triangle Point and Daddy Hole. Um, the grey areas, your limestone, is another type of sedimentary rock but it's a lot harder than the sandstone. So that's why these areas still stick out. So for example, London Bridge at the bottom of the map there, uh, the harbour area, that's built on limestone. So it's a lot more resistant. And then finally, you've got your Devon Shale and Devon Slate is the dark grey. And those are your areas of highest resistance. Again, shale and slate, uh, metamorphic rock where sedimentary rock has been transformed by heat or pressure. Um, and again, this is why you get the headland. So if you think about Tor Bay as a whole, you've got the headland here and on Torquay's side, and you've also got another headland at Berry Head on the other side, and everything else in the middle is retreated softer rock. 
Um, so, and what you can see around Tor Bay is loads of different landforms caused by erosion. So, for example, you've got London Bridge just by the harbour. You've got Thatcher Rock. Um, you've got all the different coves around by um, Babacom. At the top there, you've got Anstey's Cove. Um, and yeah, you've got a nice headland and bay by Odicum Beach. Either side of Odicum Beach is a little headland. And the little tiny bay is Odicum Beach. So yeah, a bit of local geography there for you. Okay, so dynamic equilibrium in the coast. Now, dynamic equilibrium is a topic we've covered before. Um, so it's when there's a balance between the inputs and the outputs, um, although that can change. So for example, if the inputs change, then the outputs will respond and they'll come to a new equilibrium. Um, so there are quite a few good examples of dynamic equilibrium at the coast, um, particularly with reference, like I've put here, to rising sea levels. So as sea levels get higher, chances are the amount of energy in the coastal system will get higher as well. So there'll be more erosion, but the change will be so gradual that the, the, the everything will go back into a balance. Um, I've put a little example on here, um, for you to have a think about. So material from cliff at beach A is carried from beach A to beach B via longshore drift. The material is then deposited at beach B on a sand spit. The sand spit is eroded by winds and the material is carried inland. So in that sentence, I want you to have a look at that and go, what are the inputs in that sentence? What are the outputs? What are the stores and what are the transfers? And then think, what could potentially disrupt the equilibrium in this system and how could these disruptions affect the environment so have a think write down some ideas and we'll go through those at the start of the next slide so from the previous slide your inputs were the cliff erosion at a provides sediment to the system and longshore drift delivers sediments to the system at B. Um, so those are the two inputs. Um, the store, obviously you've got your cliff is the store until it's eroded, but also you've got the spit at B is the store mentioned. And outputs, we've got the landward transfer of sand um, from the spit moving inland to an area behind it. OK, so this moves brings us on to feedback in the coastal system. So remember, you've got two types of feedback. You've got positive and you've got negative. Positive is where things change away from the norm. Um, and one change amplifies another change, which amplifies another change. And you get further and further away, kind of like a spiralling effect. Um, and negative feedback, remember, everything gets back to normal. Um, everything balance, uh, balances each other out and you get a new normal formed. Um, so in the coastal system, obviously, if you change the inputs, you're going to change the outputs. So that might be um, so an example, negative feedback, for example. Um, during the winter storms, this happens to a lot of coastal coastal sand dune systems. The dunes at the front of them are destroyed. So these are called your embryo dunes, your small dunes. They're destroyed by the storms. But then in the winter um, and in the spring, when things get a bit more gentle, the process get back to normal and the storms, are, and the, um, storms subside a bit and the sand dunes get rebuilt. However, positive feedback um, in the coastal zone people walking on sand dunes can cause what's known as a blowout. Um, there's a picture of a blowout in the bottom right. Basically, it's where one area of the sand dune is exposed to the wind and the elements. That area then experiences more erosion, which then damages the areas around it, and they experience more erosion, which damages the area around them. And then by the um, within, a, within a short period of time, you've got this area called a blowout, where basically the sand's been removed. Um, they're quite common, unfortunately, on sand dune systems that are popular with tourists. So those are two examples of positive and negative feedback in the coastal system. Um, 
just be aware of these because these are really, really good to link into your 20 mark questions about positive and negative feedback and how one impact is going to um, amplify another one or bring it back to normal. So we've looked at inputs and outputs and transfers and feedback in a system. But all of those things are going to be affected and shaped and dictated by different things that are happening and are present within that system as a whole. So we've got different processes occurring. Um, these might be marine processes, which means underwater. They might be terrestrial processes, which means on land. They might be atmospheric processes in the so, for example, the winds and the weather, and they might be biological processes that basically move the material between the stores. We've talked about a few of those already. So in one area, so at one beach, you'll have marine, terrestrial, atmospheric and biological mechanisms all at play. And that is either going to speed up or slow down um, the movement of material between stores. Within that as well, you've got controls. Now, these are the things that are going to limit it or speed it up. So, for example, the climate, if it gets a lot of wind and has a lot of storms, it's going to have a lot more erosion and that's going to happen a lot more quickly. If, for example, the geology has got really, really, really hard rocks, then the process is going to happen really slowly. On the other hand, if you've got really soft rock, they're going to happen a lot quicker. The structure of the rock, so have you got a lot of different rocks next to one another within one system? So that basically the more different rock types there are, the more joins and the more faults you've got between each rock type. But if it's only one rock type, then chances are it's going to be a big solid lump, so it's going to be much harder to erode. Things like the sea level as well, so that can go up, that can also go down, which we'll come on to talk about later. Um, and you've also got all of these factors that can change um, within an area. So it might be that one area is protected by really, really hard geology. Then suddenly that all gets eroded or breaks through and things change very, very quickly. So each of those factors are going to control how quickly or slowly the processes occur. And then we've got the landscape components. Now, these are the things that are the features of erosion or deposition. So if you go to the beach, and you look to your left and you can see an arch, you're thinking oh, an arch is made by erosion, therefore erosion is happening here. If you go to the beach and you see a massive sand dune system, you think oh, sand dunes are made by deposition, therefore deposition is happening. So your landscape components are kind of like the evidence um, of what's going on there. Um, OK, there's some little questions on the right. So what processes come to mind when we talk about these? What examples of processes can you think of and what end results can you think of? I've mentioned a few, but just try and have a think of some more. Right on to sediment budget. So there's three types of sediment budget. The following slides are going to demonstrate these. I've made some lovely little diagrams that actually move around and stuff. Um, to demonstrate each budget. So we've got positive budget, we've got a negative budget and we have a neutral budget. So let's get stuck into those. Positive budget. Now this is where materials added to the store so it gets bigger and you can see from the lovely little demonstration from the pebbles being added to the beach every time a wave comes in materials added it builds up and the store gets bigger and bigger and bigger yeah so positive budget materials added and the store gets bigger negative budget so if a positive budget is where the store gets bigger a negative budget is where the store get smaller so you can see again through my lovely little um, I don't know what you call that mechanism diagram thingy um, every time the wave hits it's taken away material so the store is getting smaller and smaller and smaller so negative budget store gets smaller
So if a positive budget gets bigger, a negative budget gets smaller, a neutral budget stays exactly the same. So each wave will add material, but then the same wave will take away the same amount of material and the beach size or the store size stays exactly the same. Nice and straightforward in a nice equilibrium, not much change, not much is going to happen here. So neutral budget, the inputs equals the outputs. Good times. Sediment cells. So around the UK and all around the world, there are these things called sediment cells. Now they may also be called littoral cells. And the word literal basically just means sediment, okay? Um, you might also hear of literal drift, which is another name for longshore drift. So literal sediment. Now, you can look at the map on the right hand side and you can see how the UK is divided into all these different cells. Now, within each cell, the material will remain for a significant period of time and only major events will enable a piece of material to leave this cell. So, for example, if you look in the very, very bottom left of the map, the southwest, you can see the cell that we are in. So it goes all the way from Land's End all the way up to Portland Bill um, in Dorset. And that is our sediment cell. Now, each sediment cell is a closed system, which means no sediment enters or leaves the system. It just stays within there. So we could get a piece of sediment from Cornwall that could travel all the way along the coast to Devon and it could stay there, but it could go no further than Portland Bill on the um, far end of it. OK, now that that's important to remember, because within a littoral cell, you'll have a range of erosion and deposition, but it will always be in a balance. So wherever you have erosion somewhere else within the cell, you must have deposition. So these cells are all perfectly balanced. And like I said, only a major event could cause that. And when I say major event, I mean like a huge storm might move some sediment from one place to another. It could be a massive, uh, like a tsunami or something like that. Hopefully we don't have any of those, but you know, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. So yeah, sediment cells, they're split up. Some cells are bigger than others. Some cells are really, are really huge. Some are really quite small. Um, and yeah, it's how the UK is divided up and it's like loads of little tiny coastal systems all around the UK. And remember, each one is closed. Closed. Systems. Now, although a littoral cell is a closed system, the coast as a whole is an open system. And I will explain why. So. Inputs and outputs can enter and leave the system from elsewhere. So, for example, on here, longshore drift can move sediment along the coast and that could be amplified during a storm. Waves can come in from a long, long way away. So the distance a wave travels is called a, you probably know this, it's called the fetch. And waves can travel basically across the oceans uninterrupted, bringing energy from other areas. So therefore, the coast is open. Sediment might travel downstream from a river and be added to the beach. You can see at the base of this river here, right in the center of the image, you've got a nice sandy beach. Some of that material will come from the river. So that's coming from inland. Also, material might move inland. So it's leaving the system. So literal cells are closed systems, but the coast as a whole is an open system. And I think if you look at the five points on the diagram, you can see how the coast would class as an open system. So sediment cell, closed system, coast as a whole, open system. Feedback. So here we have an example of negative feedback. Um, so have a look at the image and think, how would negative feedback be happening here? So remember, negative feedback is where it gets back to normal. 
So what happens is the groins have been put in at the bottom of the cliff to trap material and reduce the rate of erosion on the cliffs, which will keep the cliffs the way they are for now. So what we've done is we've put in the groins to reduce the amount of longshore drift, remember not stop longshore drift, reduce it, therefore reduce cliff erosion. So we're reducing all the processes, we're keeping this, this the landscape as it is, so therefore it's negative feedback because we're not amplifying the changes, we're reducing the changes and keeping things the way they are. A second example of negative feedback would be the change in a coastal system after a storm. So during a big storm, lots of material from the land will be eroded and removed, um, which will change. But also some of that material can go out to sea and be built up as a sand dune uh, system behind a beach or a sand bank just off the beach. Now in the picture, you've got a sand bank. And what that's going to do is it's going to reduce the amount of erosion on the shoreline as it basically acts as a little barrier. So that sand bank would have been made by the storm, but actually it's gonna long-term reduce the amount of erosion, keeping things normal, reducing the processes, so negative feedback. So the storm would have changed the whole dynamic of it, but then the sand bank reduces the erosion, so it keeps things normal and as they are, so it's negative feedback. This is a diagram of the negative feedback in action. So you can see the wave energy during a storm increases. So we've got an example of positive feedback. So the dune front erode, is eroded by the increase in wave energy. That then has an incre increase in the offshore sandbar formation. So you can see the first two, we've got changes where we've got positive changes, positive feedback. And the last one, we've got negative because actually the sandbar decreases the wave energy. Therefore, we're back to normal where we've got a much lower wave energy because of the sandbar formation. So we've got a big change during the storm, lots of erosion. Then we've got a big change where the sandbar is built and then the wave energy decreases. So that's an example in diagram form of negative feedback. Positive feedback. So positive feedback, remember, is we keep getting further and further and further away from the starting point. So an example of positive feedback at the coast is a cove. Now, in the bottom left, you've got Low Earth Cove. And what's happened there is the two pincer points at the mouth of the cove are made of really hard resistant rock. But in the middle, it's been breached. And actually, Low Earth Cove is breached by a river that was running through it. Um, only a tiny little river, but it's happened. Now, what's happened is once the river has eroded through the hard rock, suddenly the soft rock behind it is exposed and the processes speed up and speed up and speed up and the cove gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what we've got is we've got further away from our original starting point, which was the line of hard rock at the coast. Another example is a sandbar being breached during a storm. Now, a sandbar, like we've said on the previous slide, protects the environment from the wave energy. But if the sandbar is breached, then you can actually get a mass increase of erosion behind it. So things get away, further and further and further away from normal. So we've got two in examples there of positive feedback. So a cove and a sandbar being breached during a tropical storm. And this slide is a diagram of positive feedback. So you can see we start with some wave erosion that breaches the dune, that increases the amount of undercutting by the wind and removal of sediment, that increases wave erosion again because more area can be exposed to the waves, which means more dunes get breached, which means more wind erosion happens, which means more wave erosion happens. So it's just a constant cycle going round and round and round and round and round of positive, 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 and you end up with way more erosion than you started with. 
And just to end with, um, so you've got a bit of independent stuff to do, I've put a nine mark question on here. So uh, uh, try and do it about a page. Um, do this word processed ideally and email across to me so it makes it easier to market. If you can't, just do it on paper, take a picture of it, send it in. Um, or I think you can just submit it straight on. I'll set this as a question on Google Classroom as well. So you can just submit it straight on there if you want. So the question is assess the importance of different sources of energy in the creation of coastal landscapes. So think about the energy as an input, where it comes from and which source of energy is the most important in the coastal system as a whole. OK, so I'll give you um, I'll put that on Google Classroom. I'll put a, a due date on then and later in the week I will upload my second coastal PowerPoint as well. So we'll aim for two a week on this. OK, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for listening. And yeah, look forward to receiving these answers from you.